Good morning. Good morning. My name is Mary Ann Yonke, and it's so good to be with all of you this morning, whether you're worshiping online, here in the sanctuary, or a first-time visitor. We are so happy you are joining us here at Garfield Memorial Church. We all come with our joys and our sorrows, our needs and our gratitudes, and it is the one who calls us here today that offers peace and healing and joy in him because we are his children and it is his desire to do so. So please join me as we begin our worship by standing and reading the responsive reading followed by the hymn. Lord, you call your people from the north and the south, the east and the west. You long to gather us from, from the places we have wandered into a community of love, unity, and justice. Open our eyes that we may recognize your presence among us and clothe ourselves in your mercy. Uh, um, 
sister, let's keep her in prayer. And introduce yourself if you share. I was rude that I introduced Barb before she got a chance to. And uh, others want to share what God's up to do in Rome. I'm Ron Yankee. I'd like prayers for a young lady who's struggling with addiction and uh, all the problems that come with that. And a friend who's uh, struggling with addiction. Others. Yes. Because I'm close enough. I couldn't reach my I knew it was some month. <laughs> so I just wanted to give an update on Anna, uh, David Michelle Hines' daughter, who was in the ICU at Main Campus Student Clinic. Uh, she is home, and she is receiving home health care and doing much better. And so on behalf of our entire family, I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for all of the prayers and the outreach and everything you've done for our family. Uh, she still has a ways to go, but we're, we're headed in the right direction. So thank you. Praise God for healing for us. Craig McGaughy, choir director. Uh, we have several of our choir members in need of prayer. John Haga, Jeff Swindler, and we ask prayers for my mother. She's at Hospice House in the final stage. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to risk it. I don't have permission yet, um, but I'm sure it's okay. Keep on with the Hannah family in your prayers. Um, Nancy's, Hannah's daughter um, was found um, deceased this past week, and so it's, it's, been a, it's been a bit of a tough ride, so keep the Hannah's in your prayers. Um, don't start calling and sending cards until I give you the okay, because um, I rarely do that until I have permission, but I, I think they'd um, be okay with that. Uh, and on that note of cards, if, you know, if you hear these concerns, um, contact, you know, my wife during the week, she's at the office, or email her, T-E-R-R-I, she's Terry with an I, this is Pastor Terry with a Y, and I'm Chip with a P, um, but email her or let her know, uh, we've done that, um, you know, just this week, we have contact, and, and uh, we're able to know what's going on, and if you'd like to send a card or something to these, let her know, she'll give you an address. Uh, Joy, in our life, is our daughter, Gianna, who went to Supposed to go through two brain surgeries at the beginning of December, one through three. Um, she's returned to work on Monday, so God is good. Um, after, after 10 weeks, praise God. We're glad she's remote, but she's doing amazing. And, uh, and she wants to thank everybody for it. She just got overwhelmed with the cards. And it's little things, right? And she decided she, when she was recovering at our place for eight weeks, she said, Dad, I'm just going to open a card again. And she does that and says a little prayer, so thank you for that. Um, the other joy uh, that I have is our preachers today are part of our team here. If you haven't met um, Caleb and Lelani Angel, you really need to. Um, if you're online, you're new. They are our Connections pastors here. They're kind of also our Next Gen pastors. Um, a lot of the newer folks that continue to come into our church are really in the millennial age group. They're younger. Um, and they come up to me, and I feel irrelevant. And they say, no, we, we can still tolerate your preaching. It's okay. And I say, yeah, but I could be your dad. Like, you know, but uh, Caleb and Lonnie have just been such a breath of fresh air. They've made us so much better. And um, they bring so many gifts with them. They came in from Oklahoma from an amazing church and uh, came to kind of plant the church. And I'm glad, glad God planted them here, whether it's for a season or forever. Um, but I, I hope you appreciate them. And if you want to have them for a meal or meet them for coffee, um, be patient. They have four young children, but get with them. Um, and all of us, you can contact any of us, online as well. It's just our first names at GarfieldChurch.org. So Caleb, Rolani, Chip, Terry, whatever. Just pop us off an email and I'll uh, make that connection. So, so grateful for you guys and, and just uh, the gifts you bring us. And I know the gift you'll bring us today through God's word. They get the E, E, N, bless. I got L, listen. I can't listen, and I preach on I can't eat. Uh, so you guys got that one. All right, let's go before our God in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for being among us today. You say and promise us where two or more gathered, there you are. Um, and you're here, and we celebrate you, and we celebrate the work that you're doing in our lives, um, in our good times, and in our struggles, Lord. You've heard the petitions of friends here who are lifting up people to you in need of healing, uh, to 
walk through grief, to face addiction. God, um, you are the great shepherd. You leave the 99 to go to the one who's hurting. And so as we unite our hearts with these concerns today, Lord, we know we're just simply uh, lifting to you something you already know about and you're already at work and we celebrate that you're with us in those difficult times. Lord, on the fourth of celebrations, um, you love parties. Your first miracle, Lord Jesus, was at a wedding. Um, when the prodigal came home, you threw a, a great, amazing party. You said the kingdom will be a party. And so, God, thank you for being with us in times of celebration and letting us know that that's the real story. That's the end of all stories um, as we come to be with you. So today, Lord, we recommit this church and our lives um, to widen the circle, to extend your love out into the world, to connect diverse people who share a common brokenness like all of us are broken with you, Lord Jesus. Help us to be bridges of reconciliation in this world. We commit to it. And Lord, we've been committing to start this year off with an absolute, undying commitment to your great commandment to love our neighbor. Help us to do it, Lord. This world needs it. And it's, it's not someone else's job. It's our job, so you call to be your witnesses. So, Lord, we're going to recommit now to the kingdom building work as we pray that prayer you taught us to pray. As we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time of worship for our offering. And the truth is, our whole worship service is an offering to God, as we lift up our praises, and our voices, and our prayers. And hear God's word read and proclaimed. But we have an opportunity to give of the resources that God has given us. Uh, if you're new here, we don't expect you to give. And if you are new, we hope you'll go to new at gmc.org. It's all spelled out. Uh, it's in your bulletin if you're here in person. It's easy to find on our website. Short survey, way for us to stay in touch with you beyond our moments in worship together. And we have a little surprise for you. So we hope you'll take it. Take that little, little quick, we'll just take a couple of minutes, and we'll be able to follow up with you. Um, there's also other ways to get involved, uh, see in your bulletin, but the new group starting tonight um, around faith building and our faith journey will be at 7 o'clock in the chapel here. Um, you can just show up, or just come if you're interested in small group community and being with others. We also have pizza with the pastors next Sunday after services at 11.30, again up in the chapel, with um, pizza, pastors, staff, a chance to ask questions, get to hear about the DNA and the vision of our Memorial Church, and for us to get to know you. So we hope you'll stop by if you're on the newer side here, and give us a chance to connect um, and eat together. We'll be fulfilling this week's sermon, so you'll be winning. But truly, our, it, as you talk about loving our neighbor, one of the ways we do that is through the offerings, not only of our time and our talents, but of the resources that help to build up the kingdom and to reach people and widen the service. So thank you, whether you give online, you can give by text, uh, here in the worship center, or the ostrich will be coming forward in just a moment. But however you give, know that it's used for God's work to help upbuild the kingdom. Let's continue to worship God by the giving of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Yeah, 
children. Don't you get too weary that we break a camp meeting in the promise that Lord I walk and never Wisdom is 
was proved right by her deeds. This year is the 75th anniversary of a event called Kristallnacht. That's when the Gestapo was going through the city of Cologne looking for the Jews. And in 1988, they found this transcription on a wall. It's a real testament of faith. I believe in God even when I don't see, hear, or feel. Amen. <clears throat>
like eating the good food, I like taking the pictures. Um, and so where I'm going to start is a story from when I was in Bible college um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I had roommates and we had floor mates. So I lived in an apartment with four women and then across the hall there was four other women. And we had different backgrounds, diverse cultures, Nigerian, Southeast Asian, Costa Rican. And I feel like a lot of us were missing that component of home. We all were away from our parents, you know, in college. And so we got the idea of like, let's save some money. Let's start cooking together. Let's meal plan so that we can have a taste of home, but also, you know, be smart with our finances in college. Um, and so weekly we would get together, we would cook with each other, and it grew a community that I didn't know that I needed until I looked back and I'm like, wow, these women shaped my, my upbringing in college um, in a way that at that time I just thought we're saving money, we're cooking, we're, we're having a good meal. Um, but looking back, it's like those women were pivotal in my season there. And another part of that season is meeting Caleb. Now, I was friends with his roommate, and we led worship together at a church. And they were, people were trying to put Caleb and I together, you know, set us up. And Caleb had said, no one knows me better than myself. You're not setting me up with her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's fine. So I was like, well, I have something that I can, you know, sneak in there. I like to cook. So I would tell his roommate, I'd make like an apple crisp here, a peach cobbler there, some dinner meals, and I'd say, hey, make sure Caleb gets a piece of this. Like, and then text me what he says when he tastes the food. <laughs> and so you would go on, I'd be like, hey, did you take a bite? He was like, yeah, you know, he works late, but I, I watched him, I mean, it'd be like 12.30 at night. He did take a bite of the peach cobbler. He really liked it. Like, did you say it was for me? <laughs> and so here we are, you know, nine years later, and he's still eating my food. So <laughs> without food, I would think we probably wouldn't even be here. But that just goes to show the power of food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting, that story, because when I was younger, like she said, I didn't think anybody knew me well enough to set me up, not even my parents. And I used to say, like, I didn't care if somebody would cook. I cared about other things a lot more like somebody who could maybe preach with me to be honest I was like more interested in interested in somebody who had passion for ministry and spiritual things and that I wanted somebody who could partner with me in that way but am I thankful that she can cook absolutely I think it shows I think it shows but you know I think if all of us were to take a moment and and talk about food we could all list some really good food actually it might be a good idea just like if you want to take a moment for a second maybe just say out loud what's something that's one of your favorite you know food delicacies to enjoy chocolate, chocolate yeah <laughs> I hear a lot of good ones I know recently we were talking was it the hamburger or cheeseburger is like the American I love cheeseburgers, by the way. But there's so many good types of food, all kinds of things around the world. You know, personally for me, I grew up with very Southern American style food. And as I got older, I got to explore a lot of food from different cultures, different places around the world, especially being in Tulsa like my wife. I had friends, like I had a roommate who was from Vietnam and he introduced me to a local Vietnamese restaurant and he would make food for me. It's wonderful to enjoy food. And food is really something that is, hu that is really distinct you know, to humans. It's unique to us. We connect with it and we connect with each other through it. You know, it's something that we need to survive. It's something that brings us comfort in times when we're low and, and in sorrow. You know, it's something that, like my wife mentioned, we get creative with it. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I watch videos online and I see people doing incredible things out of food. There's this one guy I see all the time. He does like chocolate art. I don't even understand how that's possible, but you know, without it getting everywhere. But you know, people do just incredible creative things with their food. You know, for many of us, it has cultural significance. It represents where we're from, the people of origin, our ancestry, you know, our nation. It has significance in that way. And even sometimes it's tied to our socioeconomic status. You know, having access to food or maybe the quality or the type of food that you have signifies your socioeconomic status. So I think, 
you know, as we talk about these things, there's rituals that spontaneously happen among humans around food. And if you think about it, I think holidays, festivals, sporting events, you know, birthdays, anniversaries, all of these ceremonies that we have, they would kind of be less fun without all the food and feasting that we enjoy, right? Uh, it's really central to who we are as human beings. And Luis O. Fresco, who is a writer and a scientist, he said this, for human beings, a meal is never just a meal and a snack is never just a snack. The rituals of our meals gathering around a table, sharing food with people who are beyond our direct relatives, are unique to our species and make us human. I don't know if I've ever thought about that before, but a scientist is telling us there's no other species that sits down and shares food with people that are not their direct relatives. That's something really distinct to us. So one of the things we're talking about in this series is how do we bless our neighbors? people that are maybe not direct relatives to us. And today, eating together is, is the way we're talking about it. But food is intricately bound up in our relationships too. You know, I didn't know this, but the word companion has two Latin words as its root. It's cum and panis, which mean with bread. That was really fascinating to me. And the original use of the word was to say a companion is somebody that I share bread with. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Food is really connected to who we are as human beings, how we identify ourselves, how we relate to each other, how we form society. And research, there was a bunch of research I read from some pretty amazing people, but it has revealed that the more often people eat with others, the more likely they are to feel happy and satisfied with their lives. I don't know about you, I spend too much time eating by myself. I don't feel happy and satisfied in that moment. I'm always still hungry. I don't have a smile on my face. I'm not laughing because there's no joyful conversation going on. I'm missing out on that component of sharing a meal with someone else. You know, Ecclesiastes 3.13 says, people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor for these are gifts from God. You know, if you think about it for a moment, in the, sto in the story of creation, God created food before he created humans. He made sure we were here after the food was because it's crucial to who we are as people. And if you look all throughout the stories in the Bible, whether it's with the Jewish people and their writers, or it's with the early church and the apostles, you see metaphors of what food means in culture, in religion, in spirituality. You know, it's constantly used as a reference point, even, you know, to the point that food is central to the fall of mankind. <laughs> I mean, it is connected to every part of who we are and how God designed us. So sharing a meal has the power, I believe, to fulfill every human need, whether it's meeting a necessity because we can't survive without it. It's something that is beyond ourselves. It reminds us that there's more besides what we can do for ourselves that we need to exist. It's something beyond us. It's cultural and it's also social. Food has all of these dynamics. So the first point I wanted to share with you today, or we wanted to share with you since we're <laughs> preaching together, is sharing a meal makes us more human. Yes. Um, and this may come as no surprise, but the best examples of the power of eating together uh, comes from Jesus. There's something distinctly... Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so who you eat with says a lot about you and how much you value that person. So, you know, Jesus was one that ate with everyone. Jesus ate with sinners. And if you go back to the scripture, it said, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And so he was our prime example of eating with people that didn't look like him, didn't sound like him, didn't behave like him. Um, and throughout the gospels, we see Jesus eating with people. Eating was essential to his mission of seeking and saving the lost. Um, now, if we made a list of all the great things Jesus did to bless people, I wouldn't put eating on the list. Not, not the top of the list. 
But, you know, some of his blessings were his teaching, his healing, his praying, walking on water, various miracles, even his death and resurrection. Um, but a major part of how Jesus blessed the world was by eating. And as Pastor Chip mentioned, let's look at some of the examples. Jesus began his ministry at the wedding feast, his first miracle. And when it says feast, I can only imagine the table, the spread, the food that was there, you know, culturally and just feeding. I, I don't think of a small group. I think of maybe hundreds of people feeding and, and nourishing um, them. And the, one of his most well-known miracles was feeding the 5,000 yeah. with, you know, two fish and five loaves. There's another eating example. On the night before the crucifixion, there we go again. He's sharing the meal with his closest disciples. Um, and we still practice that today, you know, at the Lord's Supper or communion. Um, and then even after his resurrection, he shared breakfast on the beach with his disciples. So we just have these, um, we see in the story, just the meal after meal after meal that Jesus had. You know, in fact, apart from Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection, 50% of his ministry was centered around meals. So if Jesus began and ended his earthly ministry with food, then food should play a significant role in our mission to connect diverse people, you know, share a common brokenness with Jesus. And so our point number two, sharing a meal makes us more like Jesus. There are many reasons that, you know, eating together may be difficult or feel uncomfortable, or I should say feel difficult, because it's not difficult, but it could feel difficult or uncomfortable but I believe it's worth pushing through um, our excuses, getting out of our comfort zone so we can truly love our neighbors, you know, as God called us to. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, um, as I was kind of looking into this series and about food and what it means to us, I came across something that really blew my mind. I had never heard of this before. It's something in the UK that's called the Big Lunch. Anybody familiar with that? No, me neither. So I think it was about 2013, we're all in the same boat. If I remember right, it's about 2013. This initiative was started that annually they were gonna celebrate, it's kind of like a specific day or a week out of the year, and I think it's in June, but they wanted to encourage everyone in the, in the UK to gather together with your neighbors, whether it's block parties, sitting at tables, you know, grilling, whatever it might be, but get together with your neighbors and eat a meal. What they were finding through research is that people were incredibly lonely, they were isolated, they weren't feeling happy, satisfied, all of those things that come from eating together, and people didn't really know each other. And so this initiative was started, and they've been doing this for a decade now. Um, fascinating. They said they've got people from all around the world who are joining in now. I think I'm going to be one of them this year, uh, starting this year. We actually... Interesting enough, when we first moved here, we wanted to have a block party with our neighbors. And I've shared with you before, we got here two months before the COVID pandemic started and everything shut down. But I think this is the year that we're going to finally make that happen, that we're going to get out on the street in our neighborhood and share a community meal with our neighbors. And the University of Oxford actually um, took a study and did research uh, along with the big lunch and what they found out is despite a clear correlation between social eating and social bonding, this survey showed that many meals are eaten alone. The average adult ate 10 out of 21 meals alone every week. I would say probably many of us do a lot more than that every week alone. The, um, more than two thirds of 69% never shared a meal with any of their neighbors. I, honestly, I think we're in that same boat right now. We want to, but we haven't actually taken that step. And then a fifth of the people said it had been more than six months since they shared a meal with their parents. Now, if you live near your parents, there's really no excuse. My parents live in Oklahoma. Hers are in Kentucky. It doesn't happen that often. But to go six months without eating with some of your closest relatives, that seems a little bizarre when you say it out loud. And they discovered that communal eating increases well-being whether it's a feast or a snack so it's fascinating it doesn't really matter what it is we're eating it could be a little charcuterie board you know it could just be some peanut butter crackers you're connecting with somebody on a human level just by sharing that little bit of food together and the reality is even though we know there are benefits from sharing meals many of us still never make it a priority 
right? I, I know I don't. A lot of times I eat on the go. Or, you know, I sit down on my couch. Actually, from the study, they, they had found that uh, there's been a shift in our culture away from eating at the dining table to eating. The primary places are the couch and the bedroom. We're really isolating from each other. You know, we're, we want to focus on a screen or we just want to be by ourselves because of everything that's going on in our lives. We have so many things that are consuming our time, our energy, our well-being. And as many of us, or as we've been talking about eating with our neighbors, I'm sure at this exact moment, just like me, you're thinking of all the reasons why you can't do it. I know, I know. <laughs> we've been talking about some of the reasons, and we have a few that we'd like to share with you. So we have some excuses that, that we want to share with you. So the first one is, I don't know anyone, and I'm not outgoing. Easy fix. <laughs> Um, prioritize proximity. So you don't have to go out of your way to find someone to share a meal with. I know something that seems daunting, but who do you work with? Who do you see, you know, in your neighborhood, dropping <coughs> off kids, um, at the gym? There's always people, and we're always going to eat. So prioritize who is around you. I think that's the easiest start. It's, you can do it today, you know. You're around people. Go yeah. out. Lunch. It's so kind of like that. missions, you know, I, like because the way I grew up, I always think, oh, I got to go around the world to reach someone for Christ. No, they're right across the street. They're right next door. It's just, it's that simple. There's somebody directly in front of you you can share a meal with. So our second excuse is, I don't know what to say or how to cook. I, I'm, I'm not a master host. Like if I'm going to host, it needs to be like perfectly well done. My house looks spectacular. I want to like impress the people. And we would say prioritize presence, prioritize being yourself, showing up. Uh, it's not about what you have, but whom you're having it with. Yeah. And so Linda listening here, as Pastor Chip said last week, you know, have be open, be ready to listen, be present. Don't be on your phone. I think there's a lot of times it's like, oh, this is so, you know, daunting or it's too much. But if you're just present, I think, for an example, like our kids, when we are present with them, I think that does so much more than if we try to plan this big outing of going to the zoo or going to the aquarium. They love our attention in the moment. So when mm -hmm. we're sitting down eating dinner, listening to them talk about their day, we're present and they love it and they remember that. Yeah, I don't think you have to have something scripted or feel like you're, you know, an extrovert and you're perfect at talking or you're a master chef, you know, just be willing to be yourself with people. Uh, the third excuse we wanted to share is, I don't have enough time and I'm too busy. Like, between work, family, all the responsibilities I have, and trying to squeeze in a little bit of, like, fun in my life, like, I just can't fit this. There's no space. And no space at all. Prioritize plate. We're not asking you to add on to your plate, but there's time already there. You're already having a meal. Um, so you don't have to add it to your schedule. Just focus on what's already there and an invite in. I guess that is kind of like adding, but <laughs> you just already are having a meal, so have it with someone else. Yeah, I mean, on average, you know, most people have three meals a day, and that factors out to about 21 meals a week. If you literally just share one of those meals with one other person, you're doing this. Mm -hmm. You're already eating together. It's not something like we said, you don't have to add on to your plate. You don't have to accumulate more and figure out how some extra thing fits in. Just share that same meal you're already doing with someone else. And in my case, I mean, I have coffee like almost every single day. That's seven more opportunities. Well, no, it's probably 14, but you know, it's seven more opportunities a week. I, I love having coffee with people. So if you're here and you like having coffee, please connect with me. I love coffee people. Um, but point number three. Uh, sharing a meal is the easiest way to share the gospel. Yep. Now back, you already shared your story from being in Bible college. I wanna share mine. So when I was in Bible college, I used to go out with friends all the time. We would eat, um, you know, do different activities. It was fun, have coffee mostly. Um, but we went to IHOP one time and we were a pretty large group. So we sit down, they had to put, I think about four tables together for our entire group to sit together. Um, and we had like this odd shaped table layout. And as we sat down and we started to order our food and our waiters helping us, we looked over and we noticed that there was a young man who was sitting in the booth all by himself, and he looked really down, to be honest. He just looked like he was carrying the weight of the world. 
um, didn't look joyful at all. And we just felt like he's probably lonely right now. And here we are with all of our friends and all of us eating together. So we talked to our waiter and we said, hey, do you know if he came here with anybody or if he's waiting for someone to join him? And the waiter was like, no, he's by himself. He's actually a friend of mine. I know him. And I was like, could you let him know that he's welcome to join us so he doesn't have to eat alone? So our waiter so graciously went over and talked to his friend and said, hey, you know, this group, you know, notice you were eating by yourself and you're welcome to join them. And he was very excited to just be able to sit and eat with us and not be by himself. Then he came over with a huge smile on his face. We pulled up a, ch a chair. He sat down and, joined, and joined us. And we just got to know him, like his name, you know, his story, you know, what, what was going on in life. And as we were talking and sharing with each other and eating, we discovered that he used to go to the same church as us <laughs> that both of us go to. And he had just kind of got out of church and away from God and, you know, just felt kind of lost and didn't really know, you know, that his life had any meaning or really what to do. Um, kind of perfectly exemplified in him just sitting at a booth at IHOP, not really knowing what to do. And so we just began to like tell him like, hey, you know, you're welcome to come back. Like just join us. It's so much fun. Like all of us have connected because, you know, we're at church together. We didn't know each other before this. And, um, and he got very excited about that. And even as a part of that, we also kind of got to know our waiter as well because he was his friend. And before we left, we had prayed with them, we exchanged phone numbers, and we all kind of stayed in touch and made sure that we checked in on each other and he got reconnected with church. And um, you know, there were a couple of things that he needed that we were able to help him with. But had we not went out of our way that day, even though we had friends, we were already there together. We didn't, you know, we weren't there eating by ourselves, but we looked and noticed somebody else who was alone who was eating food and not enjoying the company that's associated with it, and we invited him to join us, it kind of changed the trajectory of his life in that moment. And it blessed him on that level. And, it, and in turn, I believe it blessed us because we gained a new friend out of that encounter. It wasn't just what we gave to him, it's what he gave to us as well. And so all of the reasons that we have for not eating with others, you know, we could go on and on and on and talk about those excuses. But what would happen if we just set aside all the excuses and we invited someone to share a meal could we change someone's life could we be a blessing to our community i think so yes i agree mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> and i'm thinking you know jesus while on the mission he came to the world or came to the earth to save us if he could make time in that that short period that he was walking this earth to have meals with people like why can't we i feel like it it puts a little pressure on us, but it's so easy. It's so easy to do. Yeah, absolutely. So, you want to close us in prayer? I can close us in prayer. <laughs> okay. God, thank you so much for your generous giving to us. God, you made sure before we entered into this earth that you had something prepared for us. It was food. You made sure that it was there to, so that we could survive. It was there so we could connect with other people. God, I pray, pray that through our lives, Beginning today, throughout this week, begin to show us how food could be a way for us to connect with other people, to share a common brokenness with Jesus. God, maybe it's somebody we work with and they're just eating at their desk. God, encourage us and give us the strength to reach out and say, why don't, you, why don't we eat together today? Maybe it's our neighbor who lives next door that we often just say hi to, you know, how's the weather? But maybe it's time to invite them over to have a meal at our house or maybe have a meal at their house. God, I pray that you would just open our eyes to see the people who are already in our proximity. God, show us the opportunities that are already before us. We don't have to know how to cook. We can eat out at IHOP. But God, let us be a blessing to our neighbors. Let us enjoy the, the social dynamics, the joy, the health, the grace, the feasting, and the pleasure that comes along with sharing a meal with other people. And I pray that through that, we would see the grace um, and the joy and the generosity that you gave us through your cross, through your son, Jesus Christ, when he invited us to sit at his table and be healed and restored and reconciled with him. We thank you for this work you're doing in our lives and through us in our community. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Now, if you stand with us, we're going to have one more hymn. Forth in thy name, O Lord. series is a training series. We're feasting, if you will, off of God's word on how to better love our neighbors, the most important work that Jesus has for us in this moment, in this world, in this country, in this city, in this church, in our families. So as we go forth, reminded, be in prayer, listen with care, eat together. We're going to be uh, pushing, we were learning it now, and during Lent we're going to do it. So stay tuned for the big lunch <laughs> in neighborhoods all over led by people uh, known as Garfield Memorial Church. There's an African proverb that says, when you have more than you need, build a longer table, not a higher fence. Go forth for God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.